Good morning, Grand Center. It's good to see you this morning. I'm Pastor Bob. It's great to have you with us. I hope uh, your Christmas was wonderful, and I hope you enjoyed joining us on Christmas Eve. And this morning, it's great to gather together and to turn our attention towards Christ. Let me pray, and uh, we will be ably led in some worship together. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of setting aside this time. I thank you that across our town, our community, and uh, even around our country, there are people gathering in homes and joining us this morning. And as we turn our attention towards you, I pray that you would speak through your word, that you would comfort the lonely, that you would encourage the discouraged, that you would touch and heal those who need a touch from your hand, and that today, Father, uh, you would just meet with us. So I thank you that you're not limited by the gathering and that you're here and you're with us today. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Grand Center Alliance today. Uh, we're happy you can be with us. Well, Christmas is over, but uh, the new year isn't here yet. Uh, there's a lot of us feeling, I think, that 2020 can't come to an end soon enough. Um, but as I await the new year, I noticed the wax wings migrating through, and uh, I saw that they find their, their food on the ground and their shelter in the trees, and that God has provided for them everything that they need as they fly south for the winter. And while the world can feel chaotic, uh, most of God's creation continues on as it always has, um, relying on him daily for its needs. So I'm going to read from uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 to 34. Or 25 to 34, excuse me. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Is not life more than food or the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither spin nor toil. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So let's take this opportunity this morning to seek first the kingdom of God and praise him for his provision for us and all that he's done.
dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved unless I'm sure. You are my God and you saved my soul. Hey, church family, um, it's Bob and Kareen here. We wanted to come with a special thank you. Uh, in the days leading up to Christmas, this church's tradition has been to give you an opportunity to uh, express a gift of love to us at Christmas. And you do that uh, just individually. There's not really uh, a structured way it happens. They just open the opportunity and people take advantage of it. I want you to know from me uh, what an amazing encouragement it is. Uh, there are days when Satan comes along and says, uh, you're wasting your time, or you know, you know that you don't meet all the needs or everybody's particular desires or wishes, and uh, this particular expression of love to us it just blows us away. It, it makes us feel so incredibly appreciated knowing that you went out of your way to participate individually. And we just can't thank you enough. Uh, Kareen, maybe you could tell them a little bit about what it means for us to use it at different times over the year. Yes, it's always an encouragement to us when we get this gift at Christmas time. And over the years, we've always put some of it aside and uh, looked forward for a special occasion or a special thing to buy. And uh, yeah, just put it aside for maybe a bit of a, a holiday or some of our trips overseas. And then when we do use it when we're away, it's, uh, it's just such a good memory of who gave it to us, and it's encouraging to us. Yeah, so as far as commending you for being a church that builds one another up, uh, we just can't say enough about what that does for us. Thank you so much. Uh, secondly, I just want to say what an honor it is to be your pastor. Um, we brag about our church all the time and brag about you and your care for us. And uh, we just really appreciate you and we're just thrilled that we can journey alongside you here. Thank you. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars, I'm skinned and scarred, marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted, and sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind and something created me. No, someone created me. And that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, 
someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. So good morning again. It's, uh, it's a privilege I have to bring you the word this morning. And uh, these are the interesting two Sundays. So year after year, that Sunday right after Christmas and the first Sunday of January uh, become interesting. And I was reflecting in these weeks up to while we were preparing and uh, thinking about over the years how we've look, you know, done a look back and a look ahead. And I was thinking about some of the celebrations and the images last year. And, and you think about watching the countdowns and people are, ooh, 2020, it's going to be so great. <laughs> and there was this incredible anticipation of what was to come. And there was a, an examination of what had happened up to that point. And people were making resolutions and they were doing what happened in this past year and what are we looking forward to in the next and uh, here we are a year later and we're doing the same thing, although it looks incredibly different. I mean, it doesn't look at all like I expected it to look. Last year at this time, I was looking forward to going and teaching at a discipleship school and, and going on a missions trip to see some of my friends that are serving around the world and, and taking a, a little vacation with my wife. And all of those things didn't happen. I was looking forward to, as a church, all kinds of plans and all kinds of things, and, and that didn't happen. And in your life right now, I know as you sit today and you look at what you hoped Christmas would be, and as you review this past year, um, you, you're going to agree with so many of the memes. If you want to have some fun, go look. There's some incredibly funny memes about the year 2020. And there's one, uh, there's a picture of a t-shirt where it's like the ratings where they have the stars across the t-shirt and it's got like a zero or a one rating for 2020, do not recommend. And it, many of you feel the same way I do that it didn't fit and now as we look ahead it becomes more difficult. I mean we're going through the regular processes of uh, budgets and plans and and, and it seems like every time we thought, well, by here we should be able to, or we intend to, or we'd like to, uh, something else shifts and changes. And, and so there's this kind of discouragement and almost like a giving up that happens in me, where I'm like, I, I don't really want to plan ahead right now. And I'm tired of just responding. And I get into this mentality that's a little bit of a turtling and a little bit of, I just want to survive. This can be incredible ground for Satan to come along and say, every time your expectation and reality don't meet, we're going to write discouragement and disappointment in there. And lots of people are facing despair when they look ahead. And I guess what I'd like to do is stay with our theme that says God wants his people in all of these circumstances to not only survive the event, to not just get by, but to thrive. To be a people where our roots go deep and our love goes deep and our light shines brightly in our communities and around us. In the next two weeks, I want to talk about these two themes that are pretty normal this time of year. An examination, a looking back. And I want to say, where is my view from? What am I looking at? What am I focusing on? And what should be important? What am I looking for? How, how am I marking in my world and in my life not only the reality of this is what I've gone through, but the truth about where is God and what is he up to and what should my view be? How can I then begin to deal with some of the things that the Bible exposes that hinder? And, and, and then in the next week, how can I anticipate or what do I need to put on as I run this race, as I go forward, as I I look to thrive and advance in my walk with Jesus and my participation in the kingdom in this next year, putting on what matters. I'm going to take you to a passage in Colossians. It's going to be kind of a basis for the next few weeks. Paul's in jail writing to a relatively young and new church. 
that uh, is going to face some incredible difficulty in the days ahead. And in chapter 3, when he writes to them, uh, we'll read verses 1 through 11, and, and then we're just going to take some time to, to break it apart. Starts in chapter 3, verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now, you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, or in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So the first thing I'd like to do is just talk about perspective, or I called it looking from above. And I'm going to use some terms that uh, I'm familiar with. And I'd love to tell you where I got them from, but I can't remember. I just remember that they stuck in my head. Uh, let's talk first about citizen versus resident. Now, I remember over the years uh, with different people in different homes and and just when I started to realize that what was normal in my home, what was normal in my experience, what was normative for me, wasn't normal for everyone else. Anybody else remember that? Where you started to uh, go, what? You guys, like, you guys have breakfast for supper? That's crazy. That's crazy talk. Nobody has pancakes for supper. Or in your home, you do this? Oh, we don't do that. This, oh, you open gifts Christmas Eve? Come on, it's Christmas morning. Get with the program. This is not normal. And uh, you begin to spot differences. And as you make friends and, and you're invited into their homes as a kid, and you go, in, especially if you have different cultures, you begin to discover not everybody does things the same way. What's normal for me isn't normal for everyone. This got even more intense for me as we traveled internationally and, and we started to experience other cultures. And I'll never forget, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Asia with Mark and Paula Jones. And uh, I mean, everything from the smells to how they did life was just so amazing to me. And uh, I remember walking with Mark and, and I just stepped off the street because in Canada, the cars stop and let the pedestrians go. And he grabbed me and said, what are you crazy? You're going to die. He said, they don't stop for you here. They run you over. And we'd go into another country and say, okay, here's the deal. We're, we'll probably get pulled over. We'll probably get stopped. And when that happens, just, you know, have some $1 American bills. And it, usually it's just a couple dollars. And you're, the, the, whatever the infraction was is looked after and away you go. And you would just be shocked if the RCMP pulled you over here and said, uh, yeah, it's Friday and we're looking to make a little money for supper, so for $20 there's no infraction. That would be scandalous, and it's not our idea of how the police would work, but in that culture that was what happened. And it, you began to really operate in a way where you didn't expect it to be the same as home. In fact, you were fascinated by how they did this and how they did that and how some of their views of how family worked and culture worked and God worked were different than your own. And, and you realize that I'm a Canadian and, and I'm a resident here and I have all of these expectations. But right now I'm just residing in this place that's not where I'm from and not like where I'm from. The Bible talks about this and it talks about us as being citizens of heaven. 
that when, when Paul starts in this passage and he says, uh, if you've been raised with Christ, he says, something's happened. You became made alive. You became made new. The old died with him and, and you're new. You were buried and raised to new life. And, and it says you were born dead in your sin. Now you've been made alive. So before, while this culture was all you knew, all of a sudden your eyes have been opened and, and you've been made a citizen of heaven. You are now a child of God. You have a different name. You're part of the family of God. You have a new father. And while you still reside here on the earth, all of a sudden everything about where you're from and how you operate and who you are is going to be different. Something has happened. And so he starts this passage in Colossians where he says, if you've been raised with Christ, so if you're a Christian, and he's talking to all of you who've had this experience, and the church here in Colossians is a brand new bunch of believers, and they were part of a culture and part of a way of thinking and doing things that's been absolutely shattered by the knowledge of who Jesus is and how it really works in the kingdom of God. And he goes, if you're one of those people who understand that Jesus died in your place and that you have accepted that payment for sin for you and you've been made new, made, made alive, here's, some, here's what's going on. You, you've become part of something new. And so he says your perspective shifts on all kinds of things. And first and foremost, when you, when you come to evaluation, when you come to having a look at what you need to pay attention to, he says, seek the things that are above. The, the economy of scale, the culture in the kingdom of God, the place that you're a citizen of, where you represent, it's other. It's, it's not like the things of earth. It says set your minds or your focus. It, it, it says begin to have this mind in you that's in Christ Jesus. And he, he goes on to say that Christ is seated at the right hand of God and that he's alive and he's ruling and reigning and he's returning for his church and that there will come a day when everything will be set right where God will say, this is it, I am judging. And, and for a time, his passive judgment is there, but his active judgment will come. And there'll be a separation and those who have, are in Christ will live with him eternally and will rule and reign with Christ and those who are not with Christ or not in Christ or haven't accepted that on their behalf, the judgment will come upon them. They will bear the cost for their sin. And the Bible talks pretty explicitly about that if you want to research it. It says, for you, you've died and you're raised in him and he's living and active and ruling and you're destined for life in this kingdom. You live by a different set of rules. You live by a different set of values. The old is gone, the new has come, and your culture looks radically different. And so he says, you need to keep checking and reviewing your perspective. You see, one of the problems we face here is that the culture where we reside creeps in, right? So just like as I talked about going to uh, Asia and everything was completely different, or Cambodia where... There, I still don't know the rules of the road. Like, it makes no sense to me. I'm sure somebody's going to die every time I get on the road. It's easy to start to just adopt to how it is here. Right? So that the values of the culture where I reside, I, I just sort of adopt. And I forget that my values are set with my citizenship in heaven. And, and so, all of a sudden, when I review, I look back, and, and what I'm comparing myself against isn't how am I doing at living up to who I am as a child of God? How am I doing at living up to the example that Christ set for me? How am I doing at this? And as I review how it's going, I tend to slide into this, I, I'll just compare myself to how others in my culture or my place of residence are doing. And so I begin then to compare me versus them. To become used to how it is here and, and the erosion away from what God calls us to. 
And as long as I'm minimizing or I become dull to the damage that he exposes when he says, put away these things and put on these things. You live differently. You, you live for something different and it's going to be eternal and lasting. And what's here is deceiving and it's destroying. And he goes on to talk about some of that. We become dull to how living by th this culture's values damages our our inner self, our relationships with one another, our identity. So in Colossians 3, he uses this term, put to death, therefore. Now I'll just pause here for a minute. Um, this is a repeating theme in Scripture, put to death, put off, die to. And it doesn't say minimize, uh, exert some more control over, do better with, do your best. It says to work to put it to death. The language in Scripture says that we've died to self and that we've put to death the old man. And it talks about us being some kind of an active participant in the process. That it's not just, well, heaven is a certainty for me now. I've, I, I'm in Christ and and so I'm just going to hang on. I'm just going to survive. I'm just going to ride it out. I'm just going to kind of try to minimize how this culture around me affects me. And I look forward to that one day. He's saying, hey, you know what? You can set your mind on what's above. You can focus on things that matter. You can understand the culture of this kingdom and begin to, empowered by the Holy Spirit, live it out here. But the first thing you have to do as you look and you evaluate is you have to realize there's an act of putting some things to death, of rooting them out of your life, of putting a fence up against becoming culturally insensitive and allowing incredibly damaging things to come along with you. He says the wrath of God is going to be revealed against these values, that this is the very thing that God's coming uh, to judge people for, and, and that while he's patient, he wishes none perish, it's absolutely sure in Scripture that one day you'll give an account and you'll stand before God. And so for those who have said, hey, Jesus died for my sin, I'm in that, I'm new, he, he's saying very clearly in Scripture, these other things have no place in your life. It's not sort of a scale we're to, we're to be active in rooting them out and then he gives us a list to review oh it's a great list let's go through it really quickly because there's a constant pull in this culture towards these things right so let's talk about some of the inner self stuff some of the sexual immorality the impurity passion evil desire covetousness I mean, sexual immorality um, isn't it interesting that we've taken one part of who we are and, and defined our whole identity around it. And culture has said, whatever you feel and you feel a need to express, well, it must be okay, and so we, we, we just must be permissive in all of this. And their values have changed. And, and just an aside, if you're shocked that the values of the earth are different than the values of the kingdom of heaven, don't be. The Bible's pretty clear that they will be different. And so God, the creator who created you, says, you know, these things are going to damage you. It's, it's going to, it's, if you go down this road, it's going to desensitize, to desensitize you. It's going to do you harm. It's going to take you away from. It's going to ultimately lead to destruction in your life. He's not trying to prevent you from experiencing some kind of satisfaction. He just knows it's a lie that true contentment and joy won't be found at the end of this road. It's something culture is selling you. It talks about immorality, impurity, passions, those who are driven by their passions, that this, this absence of self-control like a motor driving a car, tearing down the road with no steering wheel. And people will justify and say, well, I was passionate about it. Well, it doesn't make it right. It just makes it destructive. He talks about evil desires, but covetousness. How about never being okay with what God granted you? Always wanting what someone else has. Always thinking what the other person looks like, what the other person enjoys, what the other person experiences somehow is more than what God has allowed me. 
goes on to talk about how we relate to each other. And he says, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lies. All you have to do is pull up your social media and pull up uh, the YouTube and watch some of the different podcasters and people on there, whatever it is, and you'll very, very quickly see that our cultural value, there's something you should be outraged about, something you should be angry about, yes? And that anger should be fed because it, you're probably right. And that should turn to some wrath. You should actively seek to suppress or do damage to someone outside your opinion or malice even. How can I scheme and plan so that my way wins and their way loses? Does this sound like politics for a minute? Or you slander. You begin to speak ill of. You begin to share with other obscene talks or obscene talk where you actually actively tear down, falsely accuse, begin to ascribe um, intention to what other people do. And then it says lies. It says lies have no place in this new kingdom in, in, the, in, in where you're from. And if you look at it, you go, man, yeah, that does describe our culture. We're driven by these passions. We're trying to justify all this stuff where our sexuality identifies us, where anything that we're, we're desiring or coveting, we can go after, and it's all excused. And, and this is how we relate to one another on this earthly plane. And it says, put this off. This stuff will destroy you. It has no place in the new who you are. And so as you look back and you begin to evaluate, it says really clearly, here's, this is some stuff that's like cancer to the soul. This is some stuff that's going to ruin you if you let it continue in your life. And there's a bit of an active part you have in the Holy Spirit revealing it, identifying it, and putting it off. He goes on to say, where I'm from. You ever heard somebody say that? Where I'm from. One of the fun things about Cold Lake is we get people uh, from all over the world trained here and, and even people from Quebec. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I always love hearing their story, where I'm from. And, and one of the things I ask lots is, tell me about your traditions, tell me about what you like to do. And, and as we visit different countries and we bring different international workers in, uh, where I'm from. And it inspires me and I learn great things. Imagine this with me for a minute. If you had a really good picture of the kingdom of God, this is the kingdom that's coming. This is the, this is the father that's going to rule and reign. Like our father's king. He's, I'll let you in on a hot secret. He set it up. We know what's coming. We know what's going to happen. And he's returning for us. And he's calling us to be something. And he's saying, these are the values in my kingdom. Can you imagine if we started to talk about where we're from and why it is, not in terms of what we can't do, but in terms of the blessing, in terms of, of who our Father is, in terms of drawing others to, because it is absolutely inspiring. I mean, it goes on to say, put on the new self. It says, if, if you've been washed, if you've, if you've died to the old self, your sins removed as far as the east is from the west, that God has provided payment for you. It says, you're washed clean. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? You know the song. You, you just stand as right before God. And it was, it's by grace you didn't earn it. You could never, it was a debt you could never pay. You're forgiven, you're new. The thing you don't do is put on your old self after that. I mean, Back when uh, I was working at the farm and my cousin Brian had pigs, uh, I would help him in the pig barn and I'd come back to the house and my wife, we had an outdoor shower and she'd say, you take all of your clothes off and get in the outdoor shower. It was outside. It was fine. And uh, no one else around. And, and you get clean and those clothes stink. If I'd have had a shower, I'd have been clean. If I'd have put those clothes on again, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. No one would do that. And so scripture's saying, hey, where you're from, you're, you don't put on dirty old clothes. You've been given the Holy Spirit to empower you to live up to your standing in Christ. 
you've been exposed to something new. You don't, know, you don't need to go wallow in that mud anymore. You don't need to eat garbage anymore. You don't need to be self-destructive anymore. You don't need to look for value in things that have no value in them. You don't need to be lied to or deceived. You can see clearly. These new cultural values are revealed in Scripture, and Scripture calls us to be ambassadors, to be light, that this new thing will be noticed. And so it says that we put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The Bible reveals to us this new self. And we're going to talk quite a bit in the next sermon about how to make those resolutions and those forward-looking things. Because he goes on to talk about this in what it is we should be seeking and pursuing and what's important and what's lasting and what's eternal. And it just changes our whole perspective on the common or earthly things. And then he goes on to talk about unity, not division, being the mark. It says, here there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Let me just unpack this for a minute. Those different groups really differed in their approach to things. I mean, if you want to just pick on some stuff today, you could say uh, there's no longer, right, liberal conservative. There's no longer these different groups theologically There's no longer these different groups that have all kind of gotten together with like-minded people and said, uh, we're right and they're wrong. I mean, there was Greeks and Jews. There were circumcised and uncircumcised. There's a huge division and debate in Scripture. You can read the story. Do we still bear the mark of the Old Testament or is the mark the baptism of the Holy Spirit on our heart? And and, and they had to come to a, a solution on this, but they had two sides that were really dug in. I mean, we see it today theologically and and behaviorally and in every way and probably with vaccines and masks and how we should respond to the loss of freedoms. That everybody seems to think that, that they have a corner on the truth and their side is the right side. And Paul is saying something really interesting. He's saying when we put on the new self and we, we put away all this other stuff, suddenly we're all drawing into the center, which is Jesus. So picture this in your mind. Picture that you have people in a 360-degree circle, and they're all on different sides of an issue, and they've all kind of debated the issue, and they all, they all kind of dug in, and, and they have all the reasons why they're right. And they pick their eyes up off of them, and they begin to adopt the values of the king, but they begin to be drawn to Jesus, and in the center you have Jesus and you're coming from the left and from the right. And, and really, shouldn't the church really be this place where people come in and they, they've adopted cultural values and they've been affected by their history and what was and there's normative to them and, and it might be different than someone else. And we keep saying, let's lift Jesus high because when we put him in the middle, what happens? We all begin to come closer and closer and closer to the center. We treat each other with a different kind of grace. And Christ is the one. And all of a sudden, there's no division. We all came to him the same way. Sinners saved by grace, under the covering of the cross, adopted into the family of God. We now are the family of God. We've put on the uniform. We've taken the identity. We've been made alive in Christ. He says, hey, where I come from, We all have Christ in common, and it's not a uniformity, but it is a unity as we draw closer and closer to him. What are some of the values of my culture where I come from? Well, what do we know from Scripture? We're a people who who just forgive one another. Where I come from, because I've been forgiven much, and because God says this is the way to act, and he's clearly revealed it, I'm a person who forgives. I'm not allowed to keep grudges. I'm not allowed to carry my hurt. I'm not allowed to be that person who allows it to embitter me. That's just not who we are. The Bible says 
where we come from, we're people who lay down our rights to serve. That if Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to grab, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a human, became a servant, he washed the disciples' feet, he said, this is what I'm looking for. This is what it's like in, the, in this culture, in this kingdom, where you come from, this is how we behave. This is the things we put on. Where I come from, we build one another up. God's the judge. We, we walk around arm in arm, encouraging people, inspiring them forward and upward, not attacking them. Where I come from, the Bible says we're people who weep together and rejoice together. That being a part of this doesn't mean hard things don't happen, but it means we cry together and we rejoice together and we feel each other's pain. That we allow it to be real and deep and authentic. Where I come from, it says our command, our call is to put God in the first place in our life. And that means that when it comes to my time, when it comes to my resources, when it comes to everything, he's number one. And he has the authority and right as king and as ruler, as father of the family to ask me for things and to have me be obedient. And then it says I'm going to love others next. And where I come from, we love others enough to share Jesus, and how do we be a part of this family where true joy, true contentment, eternal security, peace can be found? Let's ask the big question. So what? This is a great time to examine and renew. So you've been given a gift. Uh, your Christmas party's canceled. The obligation to go to different things taken away. You know that company that was coming to your house? Probably not coming. You have a little time on your hands. <laughs> and you can review last year. I'm not telling you not to say, how did I do at self-discipline? How, how did we do at? But no one could see the conditions coming. Most of the things you were attempting as goals or you thought your year would look like, uh, they were just taken away, and it's no surprise to God. But my challenge is to start to ask yourself this question. As a citizen of heaven and a resident of earth, have I become numb to where earthly values are creeping into my life? Have I started to view God in that light? Have I started to just compare myself with am I better than others? Do I need to begin again to set my eyes from above to remember that this kingdom is eternal? That it's secured? That, that I'm a participant in it? That I'm called to something? And as you do this, the Holy Spirit is going to say, uh, here's some stuff. And you have to ask yourself, am I simply minimizing or am I active in putting to death, putting off what doesn't fit anymore, what damages me, what smells bad? Having been washed clean, am I putting on the old clothes and operating by the old standards when I'm called to something completely different? Secondly, are there some issues as I go into 2021 that I need to put off? Well, let me talk to you honestly for a sec. There's a time to clean house, to purge. You have great opportunity. I call it to take things to, a, to the cross. You don't need to be in this room. You don't need to be... You can go for a walk alone. You can sit by the Christmas tree and pray. But you need to start to ask Jesus this question, whole Holy Spirit reveal in me. Are there some things as I look towards 2021 that hide my light, 
that are damaging me that I need to take and lay at the foot of the cross and say, this is covered by Christ. This needs to be dealt with. I'll give you some suggestions. How about unforgiveness? Is there an offense that you need to lay down? Just let God deal with. Say, well, they, they don't understand. They haven't made it right yet, probably. And that's kind of out of your control. But is there something you need to offer forgiveness in before you start to go unhindered into the next year? What about issues of rebellion? Ouch. Those corners of your life where you've said, uh, this is the only joy I'm finding right now, so I'm not giving it up. I'm not surrendering this to God. You can touch all this other stuff, but this, uh, this is mine. I'm going to keep this part of the old self. Where you've justified your anger, justified sinful practice in your relationships or in your inner self. Things that you were called to put off, but you're just resisting. What about issues of division? Is the Holy Spirit touching your heart today, wherever you are, and saying you need to recognize that you've been graceless with others? That as they're coming from the other side of the center of where Jesus is and they're coming towards him, uh, you're making no effort to serve them or draw them further to Jesus. And that you're liking and you're sharing and, you, and you're recruiting for your position and whatever it might be theologically or otherwise is causing division. See, if you ask the question, Holy Spirit, where have I adopted earthly positions or identities? He'll show you. I'm going to finish with a passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, after the hall of faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, for my friends, I pray that you would reach down into their homes, down into their hearts, and for those, Father, who just invite you today, would you do a healing and restorative work? Lord, as we look back, would we look back as citizens of heaven would you show us where the values of an earthly <laughs> residence have crept in? Would you remind us of who we are and where we're from? And then, Father, would you allow us to surrender those areas, to put to death those things, to nail them to the cross, to, to have, have them removed as far as the east is from the west? Lord, we know they're covered by you. And you say, if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, would we not drag things into 2021, but even yet today, even yet before the year end, would we have victory in some of those things? Would you reach down and touch people in their homes and in their places, and would you renew them in their souls? And then next week, Lord, meet with us in a, in a unique way as we look to put on the new clothes and make a commitment to the things that are eternal and important. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I get a chance to give you a benediction.
I love to do that. And so uh, I'm going to give you a benediction. There'll be a song and some announcements. Hang around, reflect, enjoy. But may the Almighty God, the creator of all heaven and earth, both bless you and protect you, keep you. Would he make his face to shine upon you and dispense his unmerited favor, his grace in your life? Oh, would he turn his countenance towards you as you cry out to him? And would he grant to you in your heart a peace that passes the understanding of mankind, whatever it is you face? And all God's people said, amen. Your family, your blood flows.